All right, good morning. So, I guess plan of the day is let's blast through this lecture and then talk about quiz one so more people come. So, let's just jump right into it and then get to talking about the important stuff, which is the quiz, which is not that bad. Whoops. Okay, mute myself. Yikes. All right. So, last lecture we saw we at least attempted to implement a lock and we failed miserably because two threads could make it to the lock code and then two threads could return from that function, which does not guarantee mutual exclusion. So, in order to implement proper uh, mutual exclusion, you have to have, you can do it with minimal hardware support, so as long as loads and stores are atomic and instructions execute in order, you can actually implement mutual exclusion. So there's two main algorithms you can use. There's Peterson's algorithm and Lamport's bakery algorithm. Um, they don't scale that well though, and processors nowadays execute out of order. So we actually need some hardware support nowadays. I might go into the details of one if Ashvin does it later, but I'll show you how locks are actually implemented in hardware nowadays. So there, the easiest way to think about how you would actually implement locks in hardware nowadays is you can assume that there is a magical atomic function called compare and swap. So this will translate directly to a CPU instruction, except reading assembly sucks. So let's just pretend it's a C function. So the compare and swap function takes three arguments. It takes a pointer that points to a number, and then it takes what you expect that number to be, and then the third argument is what you want to change that number to. And then whenever you call compare and swap, it will always return atomically what the value um, that the pointer is pointing to is. And it will only swap if you get back the original old value. So if I call compare and swap and I give it my lock I gave before and said the old value is zero and the old new value is one, it will only return zero if it changed that zero to a one. And that's the only time it will transition from zero to one, which would indicate a lock. Otherwise, if you tried to call this with zero and one and it returned a one, it means that the value was one and it did not swap successfully. So it will only swap if it returns the old value. So if we give it another shot with our lock implementation, well, this actually makes it a, bunch, a lot shorter since compare and swap actually sets the lock for us, we can just have a while loop that just continuously does compare and swap. So if compare and swap returns zero, it means we transition from a zero to a one, which would break out of the while loop because it would be while zero, which is while false, so it would break out of the while loop and then return from the lock. Otherwise, if it was already locked, it would return one and then keep on looping through this again and again and again. So now this, is our, this actually works as a mutex, and this is called a spin lock, and it's called a spin lock because of that while loop. So it just continuously tries and tries and tries and tries again if it can't get the lock, and it doesn't do anything smart, it's just wasting CPU cycles on that, this. So this is a valid implementation, but it kind of wastes time, and this is called a spin lock. So any questions about compare and swap? It's just a magical atomic function, so it either happens or it doesn't. There's no in-between, and it will only swap the value um, if it returns the old value, right? Otherwise, it just returns whatever it's pointing to. Okay, so that's a spin lock, right? That's what we implemented in the previous slide. It's a valid implementation. So this compare and swap is the common hardware instruction that you use to implement all your synchronization primitives. On x86, it's called compxchange, because that's a great name, right? It's just a dumb way of saying compare and exchange. Don't ask me why they shortened it like that. They thought they were clever. Um, but this has a busy wait problem. So if we have a unit processor system and we can't get the lock, the better thing we could do is just yield our CPU time. If, we, if we're the only CPU, or sorry, if we're the only thread active and it's locked, it, no other CPU is magically going to unlock it, right? So why are we even bothering trying when we know we 
can't get the CPU. So the better thing would be to just yield your CPU time and then hopefully the thread that has the lock gets scheduled and then by the time it's done running, it's done with the lock so now I can run, right? But on a multiprocessor machine, it might depend. So how long another thread uses a lock, maybe you don't want to put yourself to sleep. Maybe you would just get the lock and like two or three spins anyways and not waste that much time and you'd be much, much more responsive in that case. But as everything in computers, it's going to be kind of a trade-off that you have to make. But let's go ahead and add a yield. So if we don't get the lock, we'll just do the compare and swap. If we fail, which means that um, the value is zero, or sorry, the value is one, which means it's locked, we'll just yield the thread. But now we have another problem. So we have a uh, thundering herd problem. So there might be, you know, eight threads trying to get this lock, then they all yield themselves. And then as soon as it's unlocked, you have eight threads all fighting for that lock, and then seven of them are gonna be yielded again, right? Ideally, you just want to just wake up one thread, and then that thread gets the lock, and you don't have to bother monkeying with seven, seven other threads. Also, remember what we said about properties of our locks. We want them to be fair. So if, you know, you can think of it you'd rather there be a line for the lock than just you know, a giant free-for-all, which essentially this is just a free-for-all, right? You have no control over who gets the lock. It's whoever gets woken up first or whoever just tries it first gets it. There's no sense of ordering, there's no sense of fairness or anything like that. So we can do better. So you can add a wait queue to, wait queue to the lock. So just pretend we have a kind of queue structure so in the lock, if I don't get the lock, I will add myself to some lock wait queue where I'm just going to politely stand in line and then I'm going to put myself to sleep. And remember, putting myself to sleep just kind of blocks it until someone else wakes me up. So then in the unlock code, it would unlock the lock and then it would check if there's any threads in the wait queue. And then if there is a thread in the wait queue that wants the lock that I just had, then I just wake it up, right? So I wake up a thread I know is waiting for a lock. So there's two issues with this. One's called a lost wake up and the other's called the wrong thread gets the lock. So can anyone guess what might happen to cause, let's say the first one, a lost wake up? So is there a scenario where you have two threads that want the lock where one thread just gets put to sleep forever? So let's switch to this. Whoops, you didn't see that. I'll say that later. So anyone see any issues if we have two threads? put the whole thing there. It wakes up multiple threads before? So it should only wake up a single thread, right? How would it wake up multiple threads? So. So the only thread that's going to be able to unlock is if it has a lock already. So we know that this prop will just get executed by a single thread at a time. Unless, you know, we don't pair our locks and unlocks, in which case you used it incorrectly, and then that's their fault. Yep. Yeah, and then that's if a thread already has a lock already, right? Right? So here, I'll, I'll try and clarify that. So assume, assume thread one 
has the lock. So if we assume thread one has a lock, well, what can happen to jolly old thread two? So thread two can execute this compare and swap, which is going to fail, right, because some other thread has a lock. And then it will go into the while statement and be right here. And then the next thing it wants to do is add itself to the queue. Now we get context switched. So now thread one calls unlock here. And then thread one, let's label that thread one, would go ahead and unlock it. It would go ahead and unlock it. Then next thing it would do is check if there's any threads in the wait queue, which there are no threads in the wait queue yet because the thread that requested it hasn't added itself to the wait queue yet, right? It got context switched. So this statement wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't go into the if statement, so it would just exit unlock. And now at the end of that, thread one now no longer has the lock. So thread one doesn't have the lock anymore, and now it would context switch back to thread two, which then thread two would add itself to the wait queue. Now there's one thing in the wait queue, and then it would call sleep on itself. And now it's just asleep. No one has the lock, so no, there's not going to be an unlock paired with it. So it's just going to essentially be in a coma, right? <laughs> like it's not going to get woken up because you're assuming that you add yourself to the wait queue, and then if there's threads in the queue, you just wake one up. So that's an instance of lost wake up. So does that make sense? So we have to do a bit better here. Um, what about the situation where the wrong thread gets the lock? Yeah. Can you explain again how compare and swap can be useful in the So compare and swap's atomic, so it will make sure that only one thread will change the value from like a zero to a one. So that way that they both can't acquire the lock, which is what happened before, right? Where they were reading and then writing. So it combines uh, read and write in kind of a useful way where we know whether or not we were the thread that transitioned it and there can only be one. Yep. Then the other ones go in there because there's no return value. They will be passed in the well. So the other thread, it, um, after the first thread does the compare and swap and swaps it, it's going to read get uh, one return from compare and swap because that's the current value of it. So it will get the current value. value yep. 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 Sorry? So when the uh, contact switch is between the uh, lock and goes to zero and the end of the statement? Yeah. Yeah. So the other problem with the wrong thread getting the lock, so assume that, you know, so uh, assume T, T1 has the lock. And then thread two is in wait queue. So if you have that situation where it's in the wait queue, then, um, then what can happen if thread one goes and unlocks itself, and then thread one is here. So it's just unlock the lock, and then you get a context switch to uh, to a third thread, thread three that hasn't even requested the lock yet, it could go and execute this instruction, thread three, and then it just came in swoop and then took the lock when it should have been uh, thread two, right? Thread two is already in line, but if I have a context switch right after the lock, another thread's not gonna know that there's anyone in line, it's just gonna do the compare and swap and be like, hey, I changed the zero to a one, I got the lock, yay for me. So. 
another thread came in, swooped the lock. That was not super fair, right? They cut the line at Disney World. They got the fast pass or whatever the hell it's called now. Yep. And how do we know uh, when the context switch will happen? So the question is, how do I know when the context switch will happen? And the answer is, you don't have any control over when it happens. So when you need to argue concurrency thing, you have to argue that, hey, you, you know, there's a lock here. I know only one thread's here. It can't context switch in and do this code. But any code that's not between the locks, you have to consider at any time it can get context switched out. So this, and usually you just do it by unfortunately reading and understanding the code and then finding a situation in which the context switches really screw you over. Yep. So that's you changing the lock back to a zero. So it was one. So at the time of unlock, it's going to be a one, right? So we just write the value zero to it to indicate it's unlocked. So you break it down. Then, yeah. Then, oh, then we have to put a thread sleep, otherwise uh, the, the thread in the bubble will, will all be unlocked. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, well, they'll just you know keep on spinning over and over again. This is just to save time. Yeah, when it wakes up, when it wakes up, it would wake up here, right? And then try it again, and then it would acquire the lock. Okay, so that's the example of the lost wake up, just so we have it, and the wrong thread. So, except I called the thread something different, but when you create these examples, you can say whatever. All right, so this is how you fix the problem. <laughs> so, to fix these problems, you actually use two locks. So you can kind of decompose this uh, into two locks where I'll use my spin lock implementation because I know that's okay. So we can assume that that int guard represents a spin lock and the spin lock is only used for these lock and unlock calls. So if it makes it easier to read, let's hide myself real quick. Let's get out of here me. So to make it a bit easier to read, at the top of lock here, this while compare and swap guard, you can just substitute in like lock guard. And then at the end of both of these scenarios, where we set guard to zero, that's just unlock guard. And then again, in the top of the unlock code, you can think of that as just lock the guard. And at the bottom, it's unlock the guard. So where am I? So within the unlock, we know this block of code, it only runs in one thread at a time, right? It's like the same as having a mutex lock and unlock around it. So all of this will just execute in a single thread and it can't be context switched out and something else can't run that. And then same thing here. So there's uh, in the lock. So this is again like lock for the guard. And then we have an if condition that checks the value of the actual lock that we want to represent as part of this lock and unlock. So if it's zero, we just, uh, we just acquire it in this case. And we don't need a compare and swap for that because we know we have the guard and this is all mutually exclusive. Uh, this is all happening uh, in a single thread. It's mutually exclusive, so we don't even have to worry about the compare and swap to, you know, to transition the lock from zero to one. So in this case, we acquire the <coughs> oh sorry, we acquire the lock and then unlock the guard and then it would return. But in the case that it does not acquire the lock, that's when we would add ourselves to the queue. And now, because that's within that guard lock, we know we can't get context switched and this can't happen because it's the same guard lock, right? So if we'll add ourselves to the queue and no one else will try and access the queue uh, at all, then we unlock ourselves so that some other thread could execute an unlock or something, and then we put ourselves to sleep. So then in the unlock, we can, now that we don't, we're not fighting over adding elements to the, uh, to the wait queue, right? There's no data races involved with it anymore. 
We can just check if it's empty. If it's empty, we just release the lock. We don't have to wake up anything. Otherwise, we would just transfer the mutex to the next thread. So we would just check the front of our queue and then wake up that thread. So does this make sense as a better mutex implementation? So now we're fair, right? There's no data races involved with our wait queue. It's just like a first in, first out queue. And then we also don't, yeah, we don't have any data races with that, so we don't have any lost wakeups. Nothing else can come in and swoop the lock because it needs this guard. And we're all good. We solved all of our problems. We don't have a busy spin lock uh, at all, except for the guard. But that's OK as a spin lock because it's protecting a very small uh, bit of code. All right, any questions on that? Yep. So spin lock was just that. So that was our spin lock. So this was a valid lock implementation. It just wasted CPU time because it just kept on trying and trying it again. But so spin locks are valid. They just kind of waste time. So we essentially used a spin lock to implement a better lock. All right, cool. So that makes sense. So again, remember what causes a data race. So two concurrent actions access the same variable, and at least one of them is a write. So if you don't have any concurrency between them, you don't have any data races, your life is good. So that's why if we consider the, whole, the queue as a whole, we don't have to worry about any one particular element of that being involved in a data race if we just lock all the accesses to it. It makes our life much, much easier. But if we look at this definition, there might be some things we want to do as kind of an optimization. So at least one of them is a write, which means that, well, we can have as many readers as we want. And you may be in a situation where your memory location has very infrequent writes and then a lot of reads, and you still don't want any data races with it. So you can use a different lock for kind of optimizing this case, which is called a read-write lock. So with mutexes and spin locks, you either have the lock or you don't. Um, even if it's a read, you have to have it protected, even though you might be able to have multiple threads in it. So uh, mutex is just all or nothing. It doesn't really care. Um, but you want reads to happen in parallel, ideally. So the way that works is there's this pthread read write lock. So there's two lock calls. There's a call for locking it for read, and then a call to lock it for write. So the idea is that many threads can make it to a read lock call and then pass through it because it, you're essentially saying that, oh, pass this is just read, so that's fine. Um, and yeah, that, that's fine. We can have as many threads do that as we want, but only one thread should be able to go through the right lock at a single time. So this is how you could implement a uh, you could you implement a read write lock. So it's the same idea before, where we just use a guard lock, and this time I'll just not show the implementation of it because it could be a spin lock, it could be a mutex at this point. So. We have a variable for lock that represents our normal mutex, and then a guard that's only used within these uh, read-write lock calls. So the write lock can just straight up use the lock, because we know that guarantees mutual exclusion. So the write lock and the write unlock are j just correspond directly to our mutex lock and unlock. The only difference is our read lock. So the read lock just uses a guard because there'd be a data race with the number of readers. So we're going to keep track of the number of threads that currently have the lock open for reading. So, uh, so we have a lock that, we have a guard lock that protects that, um, the number of readers. So if we acquire the read lock and we get the guard, we increment the number of readers. And then if this is the first reader, so if it transitioned from a zero to a one, we know it's the first reader, and then we should grab, try and grab the normal mutex lock, right? So then that way, you can't pass a write lock, because now the read lock essentially has the mutex we care about. And then it would just unlock the guard 
again, mostly just to protect the n reader variable. And then in the read unlock, it would get the guard, again, to protect, because we're going to modify the number of readers. So you decrement the number of readers. If there are no more readers, then you can just unlock the lock, right? The lock that represents the entire thing. And then you unlock the guard. So does this make sense as an implementation? So if you have you know, eight threads all calling read lock, they would just increment the number of readers. The first one through would acquire the actual lock representation in this read write lock struct, right? It would acquire this lock. And then, a bun and then another thread can come in. It uh, doesn't need to reacquire the lock, right? Because we already, we already acquired that lock for reading. So we can just allow more and more readers to come in until eventually all the readers will unlock at some point. And then when we have the last reader, we can uh, unlock the lock completely. So does that make sense to everyone? Cool. So you know, the summary of what we talked about today and yesterday is we want critical sections to protect against data races. You should know what they are and how to prevent them. Mutex and spin locks are the most straightforward and kind of useful locks that you will grab and they're kind of the most straightforward and we know how to implement them with some hardware support. Um, you're gonna need some kernel support for wake up notifications or in lab two, you're actually doing this too. So you could, you, know, you could implement a spin lock on top of your thread or a good mutex on top of your threading implementation because you'll have thread sleep and you'll have thread wake up, right? So you could implement this now. And then if you have a lot of readers, uh, you should use a read write lock. All right, any questions about locking? All right, cool. Well, then we can talk about the quiz. All right, so quiz one details. It is open book. Uh, this is posted by Ashwin, so you consult any of your notes, lectures, slides, textbook. Uh, you're not supposed to search the internet, and you can't talk to your friends digitally, in person, whatever you want. Also, optionally, there is a room book that I will be in or Ashwin will be in, likely me, I hope, um, where we can go, you can go write the quiz if you think you know, finding a room on campus will be difficult. Uh, just as a curiosity, who actually wants to do that? Any commuters here? <laughs> yeah, so I'll be there. I, pro I have a longer commute than most of you, probably. So. Yeah, if you want, I'll be in that room. Um, I guess there's not that much interest, but it houses like, I think it has room for like 50 people or something like that. So there's that option. If you want to use it, it will be, I mean, it won't be that fun, but it'll be something. Um, the quiz format, there are going to be 15 true false questions, five multiple choice, five multiple answer, which is like pick the things that apply um, and then two, short answer, we write like at most three sentences. So on Quarkus, there was a micro quiz posted either last night or this morning. I'm not actually sure, but we can do that. Because um, honestly, this, qu this quiz isn't that bad. And this micro quiz is actually probably worse than the actual quiz. So let's go through it together. So the first question is, already, is invalid. I'm not sure why you put that on there. Um, so on context switch between two processes, the operating system has to modify the state in the MMU. That's, yeah, I guess true. So this isn't super valid for us, be, but we know that the operating system has to change address spaces. So you could answer that, yeah. Yeah, I literally went through and, so this is pulled from, I guess, an old one, because I I've seen, saw this question in the question bank and I changed it to just say address space instead of MMU. <laughs> well, it's posted here, so it's probably not in <laughs> the actual bank. Yeah. Uh, modif so that's just state in the MMU, like the hardware part of the MMU. Yeah. 
Yeah, the state of the process is a different thing. So to switch between two process, one would be like put, depending on what it did, it would either be put into blocked or put into waiting, and then the other thread would transition, or other process would transition to running, right? But it's kind of a weird, state's like a super overloaded word in computer science. All right, next question, cool. When a divide by zero error in a program occurs, a trap instruction is invoked so the kernel can kill the program. Yeah. Sorry? So trap instruction is something like a system call where you invoke it. Yeah. Yeah. So false. It's an exception. And also, if it's an exception, you'd get a chance to handle it, too. There'd probably be a signal sent to you. So false. Cool. And yeah, and that was actually a pretty hard question. <laughs> All right, question three. On a computer system with just one processor core, there are no benefits to having multiple threads within a process. I mean, that's pretty easy. If that was true, then why the hell would we take this course? Right, that would just be mean. All right, this is a weirdly worded question. Which of the following is responsible for translating a process's virtual memory address into physical memory address, which also is not super valid because the answer actually should be the MMU. Uh, but between all this, it, it, yeah, the, which of the following is responsible? So technically it is hardware because it's the MMU. So what, which is why I don't like asking these questions now because we don't know how virtual memory actually works. So the kernel will set up the mappings and then there's some hardware that actually does the translation. So it's essentially like you set up a lookup table and then there's hardware that uses it, which is not that hard of a concept, which is why I'm waiting for it. <laughs> but yeah, so hardware. All right, this is question five. This is a multiple answer one. This is tricky. Assume you have a computation such as matrix multiply that you'd like to parallelize so the computation can be completed more quickly. You can do this by either using multiple threads within a process or multiple processes. To decide which of these two approaches you to use, you consider various trade-offs. Which of the following considerations are valid? Select all that apply. So using multiple processes will result in less physical memory needed. Yeah, that sounds not true because there'd have to be some more accounting for processes. They probably use slightly more or it's like a wash or it's like insignificant at best. Using multiple processes will result in slower, more costly synchronization. True, right? Because they're in different address spaces so you have to communicate between them and you have to go through the kernel and that's slow. All right, using multiple processes will result in faster sharing. Well, that's kind of the opposite of what we just said, so that can't be true. Using multiple processes will result in higher context switching overhead. True, but this one's also kind of, yes, so that's true if you're switching between threads within the same processes without switching to another process in between. So context switching threads, if you're within the same process, you just have to essentially swap the registers. While if it's a process, you have to swap the registers, you have to swap the address spaces, and you have to swap you know, open files, other stuff we don't really know about yet. So that sounds true. Um, using multiple processes will result in fewer harder to detect bugs. Oh, we got. So, okay, so for sake of argument, do you have data races between processes? So are data races a pain in the ass to debug? Yeah, so probably true. Because most of the time, all your problems are due to two things running at once and communicating between them. So if they're in the same address space, you can't really detect if something really bad happens. Well, if everything is super explicit, 
then you actually know, pr probably have a better idea of understanding what's going to happen. And then two, if a thread crashes, your process is dead. But if a process crashes, the other, it'll probably give you a better error message and the other one will still be alive. So you'll at least be able to figure out in which process did something bad happen and you're probably more likely to narrow it down. Cool, let's submit our quiz. Hell yeah. See, so the, now you can see why I said don't be that worried about the quiz. Like, the, some of the questions. So it's like, it, it's pulling from a question bank, so it's like it'll pull, what I say, 15 true false questions out of like 30. There are some that are slightly trickier than others, but like, I don't know. At least in my opinion, like this is probably the hardest one or not, I don't know, <laughs> depending on you guys. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yep. So for the short answers, is it like, um, what is it, like, depending on the kind of question, like, what is the answer? Like, no, no, no code writing. Short answer is going to be either explain this or what happens if, which remember we kind of talked about the only real valid thing to ask and what would happen if is like, threads stuff because I can't ask anything about processes because they don't know anything. <laughs> right. All right. Well, cool. We can. So I had a request to um, also clarify, make it super crystal clear what is kernel mode and what is not kernel mode. So let's write some kernel code. So kernel code is so unfortunately, you don't get to do anything or have a flavor of it. But so here's your flavor now. So if you want to write, I don't know. OK, it doesn't. So if you want to write kernel code, it looks something like this. I don't know what. Apparently, code doesn't recognize it. But the kernel, kernel code is just C code. It's not special in that way. The only thing that's special about it in what is what CPU mode it runs in. So anything I'm writing here, if it's running in the kernel, it will be running in kernel mode and I can do any random stuff I want. I can kill all the processes if I want to. I can do whatever. I could play with hardware if I knew how to do that. Um, I don't know the calls off the top of my head, but you could do that. So it has some macros just to make things easier to debug and stuff, but it doesn't exactly look like a C program because it's missing something called main, right? So the kernel is kind of like a very, you can think of it if you want kind of as a long running process. So it doesn't have any main because it's already running. So how the kernel works is it separates code into modules and then you insert the module into the kernel and then it would execute the code as part of the kernel so it's in kernel mode. So as part of their like Fun functions, you can register a function to run whenever the module gets loaded into the kernel and starts executing. And then you can have some code that executes whenever you take it out of the kernel and have it stop running. So in this case, you'll also see that because I'm in kernel mode, libc does not exist. I don't have a C library, so I don't have printf. So what they did just to make it easier to develop in the kernel, there's like an internal buffer that they use to print messages to, so you can see. So instead of printf, you use print k, and there's a bunch of different, it's essentially like a logger, if anyone's used a logger before, that you have different levels that you can print to. So one is called kern info, and then you can just print whatever message you want. So I'll just show that this code's actually running as part of the kernel. I'll just print something into the internal uh, kernel buffer. And then when it exits, I'll just print that the exit happened. So if we go ahead and make that, we're all good. And you'll see that it generates a lot of stuff, but it also does not generate an executable at all. What it does generate is this .ko file, which if you compile like a C file, you'll generally see .o files that you can compile into an executable, right? But since this is the kernel, there's not going to be an executable. That .ko file just represents a kernel object file, 
and then you're allowed to load that directly into the kernel. So let's go ahead and do that. So the command to insert modules into the kernel is called inst mod, so install, install module, and we could say hello.k, and then now at this point, that uh, all the code in init ran because that code is now in the kernel, right? It's running in kernel mode, which is pretty sweet. Let's go ahead and see that message. So you use D message to look at uh, any messages in the kernel's buffer, right? Because this is all user space, we don't have access to kernel. I have to, you know, uh, do it as a super user and then use D message, which would make system calls to the kernel that says, hey, I want to read your buffer, right? So if I do that, I put dash L info because I only care about seeing info messages. If I do that, I see a bunch of crap that happened when I booted and then my message right there. So my message, so that is kernel mode, right? So I could have written a bunch of stuff there, but the problem with writing kernel code is it's kind of a pain in the ass, right? Even to figure out how to print stuff, there's no terminal, there's no anything. So I have to use print K, you have to kind of look up documentation and get used to it. Yeah. So the question is, could I kill a nit here? <laughs> finally, finally kill a nit. People want to kill a nit. Uh, yeah, you probably could. Can I? Uh, I don't know what the call to use is. <laughs> y you could. <laughs> but, and then to remove the module, I remove module hello. If I look at that, see, now my code exited, and that's, that's it. So, and we can even, you know, see when we install our module, we could even S trace it to see, you know, what's actually going on. We expect, you know, it's not going to print to standard out or anything, but we can see the system call to actually insert into the kernel. So if we look at that, there's just a bunch of crap. And uh, so this is the kernel module here. It opens it as file descriptor three. We see it's a normal elf file, so it's a good thing we learn what that is. So it's just some code. And then it's this call right here, f init module, that loads it into the kernel. And then the kernel takes over from there, and then it would just start executing it. So, so that shows our clear separation between kernel mode and user mode. So any questions about that fun stuff? So this is how you actually write kernel code. It's like not special. The only thing that's special about it is what mode it runs in. So, so cool. We, we all know how to write kernel code now. <laughs> but this like super illustrates that kernel mode and user mode, like they don't even really look that different. It's just a CPU mode on your hardware and it's a clear boundary, right? So I print K that is a kernel internal buffer. If I try and run this in user mode, that not even, doesn't even compute, right? It's running a completely different thing. The kernel doesn't exist in user mode. It only exists in kernel mode. So any of these calls, any code you write, it's not going to work, which is also why debugging it is a pain in the ass. So I don't have GDB anymore. I don't have, uh, yeah, I don't even have a standard C library, like what do you, what do, you do? You, you don't have malloc. Right? The kernel needs its own malloc, of course, because you don't have C. And who has to implement the mechanics behind malloc? The kernel, right? Yeah. Yeah, so question is, what's the underscore T in, like in all the definitions? It's just a shorthand for type. So it's just a way that, because typically you want to, the whatever is at before the dash T is the name of the thing, and you'd actually want to use that name. And if you, it was just called that without the dash T, you couldn't use that name anymore, because the compiler would get confused. 
So they just throw dash t to say that it's a type and not an actual variable or something. Yeah, so that, yeah, so, yeah, so sometimes too, there's all different conventions. Sometimes you can call a struct something else that doesn't have struct in front of it. Sometimes it'll have struct in front of it. That's like just random C things you can do, and it kind of depends on you. Uh, like you can get rid of the struct keyword if you want. In the kernel, they want the struct keyword always there. So if you try and contribute code to the kernel and it doesn't say struct on it and you try and hide your struct, they'll yell at you. And uh, the Linux kernel developers will yell at you if you do something wrong, <laughs> but like in a kind of nice way. All right, any other questions about the quiz or anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The read write? The thread woke up before it went to sleep? Oh. True. Yeah, it's still a problem. Yeah, so because the guard's unlocked here, I could get a wake up before it sleeps. <laughs> Second card, yeah. Yeah, I have to look at how they, I think that came up before. Yeah, but yes, there would be an, I there's still an issue. <laughs> but it'll happen less frequently, yay. <laughs> yeah, I have to double check that. All right, any other questions for quiz one, the simple quiz? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, lab, lab two is harder than my OS labs were by a fairly long shot. I don't even remember what my OS labs were in undergrad. There was one where we like uh, did a buffer overflow attack on the kernel, that was cool. But other than that, I don't remember any of the other labs. Well, you teach more stuff. Uh, I'm gonna look at what the other course did, uh, cause they did some set context stuff, so I might do that Monday, just to help with lab two. And plus we're like, they're gonna take at least two or three lectures to catch up to us on like fork and pthread stuff. So we got time. Since you would think you teach better than <laughs> No, not, I mean, I guess we'll see. We'll, we'll see after quiz one if you guys do better than that, I guess. Yeah, so I, I guess on that, uh, yeah, hopefully we do good on quiz one, but if there's like forks and stuff, we, we can do pretty good, I think. All right, let's remember, pulling for you. We're all in this together. Yeah. Yeah.